Hey everyone, I have a very special guest for you today. Someone who's going to be a part of a three-part series. Uh, let's welcome Mike Simmons to the show. How you doing, Mike? I'm doing great, man. Thanks for having me here. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Hey, I first bumped into you uh, down at Flip Hacking Live, something put on by Bill Allen, was nice enough to be a part of that event, sort of sitting in the audience and just being wowed by all the speakers. And you were, you were the man up there. Um, <laughs> just wanted to say your story, how you handled the audience and your story was was fantastic. So thank you for all that you did there. Uh, well, thanks for saying that. It's very nice. Uh, everyone says, oh, you know, I don't, I, don't, I don't need that pat on the back, but it feels good. So thank you. <laughs> I, I will admit that it does feel good when people acknowledge what you did and say they enjoyed it. Um, that means a lot because there's a lot of stress and planning that goes into being up on an, in stage in front of hundreds of people. So yeah. uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a nice compliment. Thank you. You're welcome. And again, realize this is coming for someone who's been in the business 20 years, um, does their own speaking, wrote his own book, did all this stuff. So you, you, you held the audience, you gave them real value, your stories, your timing. It, it was just nicely done. So oh, congratulations. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. You, you got it. So for the people that weren't there, which is most of my audience, unfortunately, hopefully they'll be there next year. Uh, That's right. Let's tell them about Mike Simmons. Who is Mike today? Then we'll kind of rewind the clock and, and talk about how Mike became Mike, if you will. <laughs> this Mike guy sounds fantastic. Yeah. I love the third person references. That's good. Mike, so let's sing. Mike, when he was young, no. Um, so where I come from, I don't know how far back I'm from. Everyone comes from different environments. And I think for me, at least, when I hear someone give their story or talk about anything, it's just always like nice to know if I can relate to them. You know, if it's like, well, I grew up a billionaire and I had, you know, my first Lamborghini when I was 16, it gets a little bit more difficult to really get excited about their story. Uh, so for me, uh, I was born and raised in Michigan, still live in Michigan. So a Midwest kid. Um, my family was blue collar, you know, which is that that's that's midwest for sure for sure michigan uh automotive so um kind of a union family blue collar um the goal in my family or the you know the the real uh when you really achieved it you were working for a union with union benefits and union representation and you, you worked all the overtime you could possibly get if you were working 40 hours and they offered to let you work the weekend you worked it because that's just what you do and Hopefully in 30 to 40 years, you can retire. And that was kind of the track, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. It's what my parents did and, and that, that worked for them. And that's what they consider to be kind of the dream. Like that's what you do. And, you know, when you're a kid growing up, your parents are everything. Like they know everything. So if they say that's the dream, you kind of go, okay, that's the dream. So uh, right out of high school, I started working for UPS. <laughs> so Union, check. Benefits, check. You know, all these things. So I thought, wow, I kind of made it. Like, this is where I'm going to retire. Like, I'm done even trying to <laughs> figure out. Uh, I did that for, I worked there for about five years. And by the end of the fifth year, I, had, I was 24. I had to go to the chiropractor three times a week just to get out of bed. My back was so jacked oh. up from, uh, cause I, I started off at UPS loading trucks, right? And I had that like, you wake up at 2.30 in the morning, you're there by three, you're loading trucks like a maniac by 3.15 and, and then you go drive trucks the rest of the day. So my, I got, I just hurt my back, you know, young kid, not paying attention, wasn't doing anything right. So by 24, I couldn't get out of bed without a chiropractor basically helping me. And I knew I had to change something. So I went into a different automotive uh, environment where I was doing a little bit of sales, a little bit of some other stuff and worked in a shop environment, stamping out metal parts. Like I've done all that. Like I know what hard work is. And uh, I kind of was going down that road thinking I sort of was figuring things out as I went until I was in my early 30s, like 31, 32. Hmm. And I started realizing I just hated my job and I did not enjoy what I did. And so I, I started like daydreaming, like what, what is retirement going to look like? Like when can I retire from this, this rat race that I'm in that I don't really enjoy? And I realized at the pace I was on with the increases I was getting and the cost of living increases and where the automotive industry was, 
Like I would be over a hundred if I ever thought I could retire, you know? So it's like, that's depressing. So I started looking into how do people like, what do people do who have money when they want to retire and investing, right? Stocks. And, and at that time, day trading was a big thing. So I started really digging in and trying to learn stocks and how to the stock market and day trading and how does this all work and what does it mean? And Man, do I hate stocks. Uh, that's one thing I really figured out. I dislike stocks. Like I might as well have been reading insurance books and no, no offense to insurance people, but it, I, I was so bored. But what I did find as I was Googling at the time and Google was like new basically when I was doing this, but when you, well, and back then it was like Yahoo too. So when I was like looking on the search engines for, for, for investing, if you go far enough, you'll find real estate. Real estate investing will be one of the search terms that will come up. So I started going, what's this real estate investing stuff all about? So I started clicking on it. And when you go to, to do that, especially back then, you, you come across a lot of like success stories, people talking about their first deal and talking about how they, they're doing it and how great it is. And I was sold, like I was hooked, like a, like a junkie, like I had found my drug and, and I was, I couldn't get enough of it. So that's great, right? So I found something that interests me. It's something that was a vehicle to get me out of the rat race. And then the worst thing happened that can happen to anybody who gets excited about anything. And that is analysis paralysis. <laughs> I started reading success stories like it was my job. I started buying books and I started going to, to like seminars and, and meetups. And that was fueling the, the need I had for real estate. And, and I, what I realized is I wasn't actually doing it. I was spending all this time consuming information. And I felt like I just need a little bit more information before I do this. And I'll be honest, this is something that's embarrassing to admit, but it's, the, it's real and people have to, maybe people can identify with who are listening. That was in 2002, 2002 going on 2003 when I first got the like aha moment. I love real estate. I didn't buy my first house until 2008. So oh. a lot of years in between there where I thought I wanted something and I did want it. And I was, I was like, the people, and I was this person, if you've been to like a local RIA, if you have RIAs in your neighborhood, local real estate investing meetup, and you go there, a lot of people there show up at the RIA religiously every month, and they have never done anything. They just, they're talking a good game, and they're there, and, and you, once you go to them for a while, you can start identifying these folks. I became that person. I realized I was just talking about real estate. I wasn't doing it. Mm -hmm. So, we, we did probably the smartest thing we've ever done. We we, we uh, paid for a weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, boot camp that was being offered by a local real estate investor. It was not cheap. Uh, at the time, it was $2,900 and you could bring a business partner or a spouse or whatever. And that was a lot of money. It still is a lot of money, but it was a, even more money to me back then. And we did it. <clears throat> and long story short, the guy who ran the seminar is a nice guy. I became friends with him. The content wasn't worth $3,000. I'll just say that, right? It was, it was okay, but it wasn't worth $3,000. But what was worth $3,000 was the belief and motivation that it gave us, right? The contents that we received, the information was not worth it, but it gave us some confidence that we could do it. And maybe more importantly, it was $3,000 that my wife knew we spent that she was not going to waste. So I would have maybe been likely to go $3,000, a lot of money. I can forgive myself. She wasn't going to forgive us if we didn't do it. So she motivated us to kind of get out there and make something of the money we spent. Uh, and we did. We started taking action, right? And I, I'm a firm believer that a, a, the majority of success that, that you see successful people in real estate or any, any business, it's because they're the action takers. They're people who will go out and, and start doing the work, right? Um, they're not always the smartest people. Um, and it's not that they're dumb, but it, it, smart intelligence is not a, a barrier to entry to success in business. It's, it's action, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe I was just dumb enough to not know the risks that were involved and what was actually maybe at stake. And we just started taking massive action. I'm making offers on property, buy a property. The first one we did, we got a mortgage for it. Technically the first one we tried to do, we tried to buy, we got a mortgage. We were in the process of waiting to go to closing. We had put down our EMD and the bank, this was back in 2008. The bank, the small bank that we had gotten the loan through went under. They just, Ooh. they went out of business. Long story short, we lost our EMD. It was a big disaster, thousand dollars. Like, whoa, that was a lot of money. 
the, the silver lining is six, uh, no, not six months, but three months later, when we finally bought a house, it was in the same neighborhood, same exact house, same layout, same everything. We bought it for half of the cost that we were going to pay three months earlier. That's how fast real estate was declining in Michigan back then. So we really dodged a bullet. We lost $1,000. We probably ended up avoiding losing $10,000. You know what I mean? It was that bad. So we bought our first house. We'd use a mortgage on that one too. put all of our savings, credit cards, all in, right? All in on this renovation and this flip. And we, and, and now this is Michigan and this is 2008, 2009 house prices are already lower here than a lot of places in the country. But back then when they were really going down, we bought the house for $40,000, three bedroom brick ranch with a basement. Basements are huge in the Midwest. Very nice house, right? That same house two or three years earlier was like 120,000, $130,000 house. Yeah. So we bought it for 40, we put about 15 into the renovation. We ended up making $15,000 in profit on that deal, right? Made a lot of mistakes, screwed up, learned some things, but we made money. And that's all it took for me too, but specifically my wife. She saw the, the, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow and she was like, okay, let's go get some more. And, and all I needed was that that gate to be opened. And I was like, I'm a risk taker. So I was out there making offers and stuff. So it, it was really good. We, we were successful in our little market, our little bubble, our little corner of the world. We were kind of considered to be one of the more successful house flippers there for a while. And that was sort of how I started my, my journey into real estate. I, I don't flip houses so much anymore, but, and we can get into that if you'd like, but um, house flipping for the first probably six years I did this was the mainstay for me. That's what I did. So very cool. So let's call it 2008 to 2014. You would wear the moniker of house flipper mm -hmm. uh, in Michigan. Yep. In Michigan. Yep. Was yep. that what an hour from your house? Roughly kind of a circle. Oh, you mean the, the, the Radius? market? Yeah. Yeah. It's a little different. I'm sort of at the Northern end of my market. So it's an hour to get to the Southern end and you know, half an hour to get to side to side kind of a thing. So yeah, yeah. it's, it's basically, you, you were hour. basically driving though. You weren't getting on an airplane or anything. About oh that. gosh, no, no, no. We were driving. Yeah. yeah. Local. And then, so, so you, so you start in 2008, you get the first one. Do you just do kind of one at a time? Do you still have your, your automotive job? You still stamp in parts or how soon do you go full question. time? Yeah. So I, at the, in the beginning, I was working full time for sure. Uh, a lot of late nights and weekends. Um, I ended up going full time uh, around 2012 ish, 2013, somewhere in there. Okay. Um, but how, was I doing one at a time? It's funny you should ask that question, Michael. Um, we were doing one at a time because when we got one, I would be like this thoroughbred that was like dying to get out of the gates and do another one. And my wife would say, "Listen, we've got this one. Let's let's renovate it. Let's 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 make sure this is this is success, and then we'll do the next one." And that's what we kind of did for a couple of years, and then. You know, ahead of this little, like, you know how Michael Jordan retired from the NBA, went to play baseball, was horrible, went back to the NBA? Yeah. I had a very much, I'm not Michael Jordan of real estate, but I had a similar experience. I was in real estate, doing great, kind of a little rock star in my little, my little niche in the world, and started thinking everything I do in business will just turn out great. Mm -hmm. And so I had some opportunities that were like real estate adjacent. They weren't real estate investing. It involved real estate. Somebody heard about what I was doing. They pulled me into this investment thing they were doing. And long story short, lost tons of money. I was terrible at it. It was a bad idea. And then once that happened, my wife said, listen, let's let's wait six months. Let's not do anything in business. Let's just relax and kind of lick our wounds for six months. And at the end of six months, we can talk about what we do next. <clears throat> and I said, that's fair. We just lost a ton of money and I, I get it. You're, the roller coaster ride is making you sick. I understand that. So we kind of sat around for six months. I went to work, uh, came home, watched TV, like just sort of lived that life. And six months to the day, I'm like, honey, it's been six months. Now, what, what, what are we going to do next? Let's go get some houses. And she said, you know what? Go for it. I, I don't, I want to get off this ride. I, I, I applaud you. I support you. I believe in you. Do what you have to do. I don't want to hear about it, right? The day-to-day -day <laughs> stuff, the day-to-day -day ups and downs are too much. So, and she's, she's a teacher. She has a full-time job. It wasn't like she was at home doing nothing. She had her own stuff. So I said, cool. But man, I'll tell you what, to use racing terms, the governor was taken off of my car. I, I was making multiple offers a week. I was closing on multiple deals. I was pulling in private investors to help me fund things. And it, it really hockey sticked after that. I was really going for it. And, uh, 
and uh, it was pedal to the metal for me. Very nope, cool. I think we nope. a minute there. Yeah, the, the audio is great. The video is freezing a little bit, but we'll, we'll keep going. So 2012, governor's off. Um, you're now real estate full-time, still, still flipping, it sounds like. Um, yep. Taking in private money, because again, lending was off, right? That's what people don't realize is lending has such an impact on yes answers, right? Yep. You know, I had an 800 credit score, six-figure income, seven-figure net worth, and banks told me no in 2008 and yeah. nine. It's just oh, what yeah. they did, right? And yep. why I bring that up is because we're seeing that again today, right? Lending changed like three weeks ago. And, and it yeah. just it catches everybody by surprise. It's like, well, you know, for guys that have been through it, we, we, we've seen it. So, um, so you prove, you take governor off, you start flipping, doing multiple projects, getting private money so you can grow faster, still in Michigan. Where does this kind of go? Because 2012 is probably the bottom as far as prices go. It yep. probably ticks up pretty nicely. And I don't know what, by 2015, 16, you're actually getting outside comp competition from hedge funds and silly West Coast investors thinking Michigan housing is easy. I mean, I'm sure you saw yeah. it, people overpaying for oh, yeah. stuff that you wouldn't touch. Yeah. Um, when, when does it change for you? When do you go like, oh my God, this is getting crazy again? Um, it started getting crazy uh, probably in 2015, 16. It started to get a little yeah. bit more competitive. Um, up until then, we were getting everything off the MLS. Like yeah. we weren't doing any sort of marketing. Like it was fish in a barrel. It was easy. Yeah. Um, but what happened, I had an interesting thing happen to me. <clears throat> I'm, I'm a real fan and a real, um, I really believe that people need to learn who they are. And, I, and I'll, I say that because I went for a number of years in this business and a number of years in my life trying to fight my natural tendencies to try to be somebody or something that I wasn't really designed to be. And, and I'll explain what I mean. Mm. So I was flipping houses. My my background in automotive was, I was stamping parts uh, when I started and I sort of was progressing through that world too at the same time. And I got to the point where I was in you know, mid management kind of a thing and, and I was uh, managing programs and managing timelines and managing budgets and timelines. Same thing in real estate. I have contractors, I'm managing timelines and budgets and, and it all feels really, really good. But what I didn't realize was I'm really not a detail person. I'm just not. And I realized that uh, once I kind of fast forward a few years, I started hiring and growing my business and we can talk about that. But once I started hiring people and I started really looking at uh, personality assessments and things like this, the disc test, the Colby test, all these different things that help people understand the, the mind of the person they're hiring to know what their strengths and weaknesses are and things like that. I started realizing what I was good at, what I wasn't. So along along that time I was flipping houses and I had an issue with my, with my realtor. And at the time my realtor was helping me find deals on the MLS and I was relying on him heavily to give me ARVs and let me know what I could sell for at the end of the day. I'm, I'm not a fan of putting, taking that out of your hands and giving it to somebody who's third party, who's not involved in your business directly. Cause I think that's too important to trust to somebody else completely. And I was trusting them. And we had one deal in particular where it just went complete, it blew up. Like the, 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 the renovation blew up from the contractor standpoint, standpoint, it's a guy I had been using for a while, had a lot of trust and confidence and something personal I think was going on with him at the time, but he started gouging, not showing up, you know, lying about receipts. And it was just kind of a mess. And I realized I need to find a new contractor. And I only had one at the time I was, you know, I didn't have backups and a lot of things I did wrong, but I only had one. I knew I had to find a new guy. And then once the renovation was finally done and it went over budget because there was a lot of um, uh, dishonest things that were going on with the contractor, I found out my realtor had totally blown the ARV. The after repair value was nowhere near what he said it would be. So I, I really took a bath on this property. I was really bad. So I thought, okay, here I am. I'm at a crossroads right now. I need to find a new contractor or contractors and I probably need to find a new realtor and or figure this out on my own so I don't have to rely on a realtor and I didn't have a realtor's license. So I was at that crossroad. And <clears throat> while I was trying to figure out what I was going to do, I was still getting opportunities, right? The opportunities were still kind of crossing my desk. So I had a deal in particular, I remember come through, opportunity to buy it. I went out, talked to the homeowner. <clears throat> this was a marketing deal. I had just started marketing at this point to try to feed my, my flipping business. Mm. And I was doing it poorly, but I was doing it. And I was getting a couple leads. 
So I got this lead, went to talk to a homeowner, got the property under contract because my, my hard wiring is get a deal, get it under contract. Like, and then I'll, I'll flip it, but I didn't have I didn't have the back end support anymore. But my my hard wiring is get the deal right. So I got the deal, and I'm like, okay, I've got this contract. I can't really do anything with it because I don't have a contractor. I don't have a realtor. I was sort of like in this weird fork in the road. But I thought I know a lot of flippers, and I know a lot of flippers who are struggling to find deals right now, <clears throat> because now we're starting to get where it's getting a little more competitive. So I called a guy that I knew that flipped houses and very competent, very respectable guy who had run a nice little flipping business. And I, I said, I've got this deal. Um, the numbers were, I got it for 95. And I said, would you buy this deal for 110,000? Like, does that number make sense? And he goes, give me 10 minutes. I'll call you back. He calls me back in 10 minutes. He goes, I'll take it. I was like, whoa, remember what I told you I made on my first deal was 15,000, right? $15,000. And I didn't, I didn't have to deal with a contractor or realtors, homeowners, appraisers, banks, mortgage companies, none of that. I made $15,000. So I went to closing, assigned a contract, figured it out. By the way, I had to Google what is an assignment. Like I didn't even know what to do. So I did it, figured it out. Another house comes across my desk, like literally a couple of days later. I'm like, I'll call the same guy. I know we can do multiple deals. It was a very similar house, very, very similar layout, very similar neighborhood. And I said, I've got another one, man. And I had bought this one for 95 also. And I said, would you take it for 110? He's like, give me a minute, call me back. And he's like, I'll take it. And I was like, okay, this, this is, feels way too good. Like this might be something I want to continue doing. So after that, uh, I really started wholesaling everything. And I became kind of a wholesaler from that point, did some strategic flips. I still do strategic flips. It's in my wheelhouse to be able to do it. But what I realized about myself originally, I was saying, you have to know yourself. I don't like details. I really don't like managing contractors. I really don't. I don't like dealing with the end buyer that much personally because they're finicky. You know, they'll pass on a house because of the color you painted the walls or the backsplash, like there's crazy little things that could be fixed. So wholesaling, what I know about myself is I'm not super detailed, but I also like velocity. Velocity Mm -hmm. makes me feel like I'm moving. You know, I need to be paddling hard and flips sometimes take a little longer. And I don't know, a lot of reasons. Wholesaling fits my personality better. And once I realized that, I, I started really working within my realm of what I like doing. And that's when things changed for me because even though I was flipping and kind of doing multiple at a time and I felt like I was successful, it was like, I wasn't totally in my happy place. Right. And then once I started having that velocity and I'm, I'm flipping contracts, I, st- I got a little bit more in my happy place and I could get behind that more. So that's, that's kind of how I evolved. Very, very cool. We're going to dive into the wholesale story here in a minute, but I want to go back to when you're still flipping first and foremost in a bad market, uh, a lot of deals would just show up in the MLS, right? Yep. Like you, 2010, I bought all my deals out of the MLS. What, you, you didn't have to go anywhere else, fish in a barrel to use your phrase. Yep. And it's very likely that by 2021, uh, we could be back there again. We will see. Uh, and we'll talk about that more in the next video. But again, you don't have to do all these other things. Sometimes the market is so bad, MLS is a place to be. Yeah. It just, just is. Yep. Uh, the next thing that's important about your story is you've had support from your significant other uh, from day one. Yeah, um, that's not, huge. Yeah, not everybody has it. Uh, sometimes no. it takes some work, um, takes communication, takes listening, right? Don't just talk at them, listen to their concerns. And let's be clear, we, we've been through one really bad crisis and we might be on the cusp of another uh, so some people have long memories, right? Maybe their brother, their father, mother yeah. had a bad experience. So listen to your significant other and see what's going on, right? Totally. I didn't even talk about what it took for me to actually leave my job. Obviously, that's a discussion yeah. when you're married. So um, we can talk about that uh, going forward. But yeah, there's, you, you're right. You have to listen to that person and take their concern seriously because and it's, it's a lot easier to go down that stream when someone's rowing with you or yes. supporting and pushing rather than pushing against, right? I, I have to admit, I was very lucky that way. Yeah. Uh, and then as the success starts to build, um, when did the wife notice? Did she start noticing when the governor was off like six months later? I mean, how does she notice? Do you, are you happier or did you buy her a trinket? Did she look at a bank statement one time? Was there a day that she's like, oh my God, honey, you're pretty good at this. Yeah. Uh, um, no trinkets. She's not a, she's not a material person for sure. Um, 
she, so here's the thing. I, <laughs> I am a risk taker. I, I know this about myself. And I think sometimes, I don't think all risk takers, but for me, I, I kind of joke about this, but I'm, I'm half serious. <laughs> when it comes to risk, I'm so not risk averse, or in other words, I'm so comfortable with risk that sometimes I joke that I'm dead inside when it comes to risk. Like huge rewards don't make my heart rate go up and huge risks don't make my heart rate go up. I'm sort of a a psycho that way. So I would come home and, and when she knew it was going well, I would come home and we'd be talking about our day and she'd say, oh, this is what happened at school and these kids did this or this kid said this or I had a parent do this and, you know, coworker or whatever. And I'll go, yeah. And, you know, I I would talk about my day sort of like, you know, some of the more mundane stuff. And then we'd be talking for half an hour and I'd go, oh, we closed the deal today. I almost forgot. We made $30,000. And she'd go, what? What are you talking (laughs) about? How did you not start your day with that part of your story? And I'm like, I don't know. I just didn't really think about it. It just occurred to me that we had that closing today and she'd go, Oh my gosh, I can't believe, you know? So she started hearing the, and then she would start asking like, do you have any closings today or how this week go? <laughs> and it would, it would jog my memory to go, Oh yeah, yeah, we did close one. Oh, we had our biggest one ever today. It was $50,000. Like we've never had one bigger than that, you know? And she'd be like blowing her mind, you know, but I just, I sort of strategically st- didn't talk about, some of the risks or some of the ones that didn't go so well. And not to hide it, honestly, she would tell you if she was on this call, she'd go, I don't want to know that stuff. Like that, that's the stuff that stresses me out. I trust you, do what you have to do. And when you, ha- but she was like, after a while, she's like, when you have these big wins, can you share them with me? Cause it really makes me excited for you, even if you're not excited. So, you know, but it consequently in my, in, in our industry, like you can lose money. It's possible. And I've had deals where we've lost a a good chunk of money and it just doesn't bother me either. I sleep like a baby that night and I just get up and and I I reset. I've said before, I think business and life, life, how it affects your business, however you want to look at it, it's a chess game and you make your moves. And when life makes its move, coronavirus, right? Yeah. Right. Life made its move. You can either go, oh my gosh, things aren't exactly like they were last month. I don't know what to do. I'm going to crawl into a a ball and and I'm just going to cry and I'm going to give up. Or you say, interesting life. Nice move. Interesting move. Okay, you got me. I'm going to move here and get out of this problem. So you have to strategically look at life and your business and everything that happens as it's just this long chess game and, and you, it's, it's our move, right? Life yeah. threw us a, a little bit of a curveball, yeah, like So it. it's our move now. So take, take your move, think about it and be strategic and figure out how you can get yourself out of this mess. So that's what I do. Very, very cool. So one last question about the flipping empire and then we'll, we'll, we'll change gears. Did you ever keep anything as a rental or was everything bought and sold in six or nine months? Was anything kept? Yeah, great question. I actually started building my rental portfolio after I stopped flipping. So okay. when I was flipping, I wasn't holding anything. Since then, uh, yes, I've taken on, uh, I, we can talk about how I structure my, my rental deals and stuff, but um, yes, I have about 20 rentals right now that I, that I hold and I'm always looking for more. And honestly, a lot of my rentals come from the wholesaling business because there's so much marketing and so much velocity in Michigan, people are spoiled. Like you folks on the West coast, when if I, I tell people all the time who are on the West, I have a lot of friends in California. I'll say, if I could find you a house that you could be all in purchase and renovation for sixty thousand dollars and it would rent for eight hundred and fifty thousand eight hundred and fifty dollars a month would you be interested and the answer is always a resounding yes <laughs> that's that's pedestrian in michigan people, people turn their nose up to that in michigan so i've built most of my rental portfolio off of deals that my buyers list turned their nose up to but it was 12 to 16 percent roi and yeah. they just go no thank you i, I want 20 percent roi and it's like what <laughs> okay i'll take it yeah. I can build a little umpire off of, you know, 14 to 15% ROI. It's no problem. Very, very cool. So, okay, now we'll switch gears to wholesaling. You, you start having success. You make those two deals, 15K with a phone call. You start realizing, you know what? There's less people risk, right? Contractor yeah. risk, timing yeah. risk, inspector risk, just less risk, more speed. Yes. Um, you, just, you just turn on a dime. You don't take any more flips. You just, everything becomes a wholesale after those first two. I let, I let the flips that I had going, I finished them, obviously right. let those kind of wrap up. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I turned my back on flipping like, like, like a uh, cold Turkey, like yeah. boom. I, I was so happy and felt so excited <laughs> about wholesaling that I was like, I don't want to deal with contractors. And listen, yeah. 
You know, but I will say this, ironically, if I was going to start over and got stripped of all my resources, money, everything, I might start as a flipper. Oh, and, I'll, really? and I'll tell you why I, I th- listen, it's just all personal, right? You, yeah. you interview a lot of people, everyone has their own opinion. This is very debatable. In my opinion, flipping is the, the, the lower barrier to entry when it comes to real estate for, for my two cents, right? Mm-hmm. My daughter came to me at the beginning of last year. January of 2019. And she said, dad, by the way, at the time she was 20, going on 24, she was 23. She had just gotten her master's degree. She's a social worker. She went to Loyola, Chicago, got her degree. She had a full-time job working as a social worker in the school system. She wasn't without work or not gainfully employed, educated, did all that. And she said, dad, when I was in college, I was working, I had an internship and I had college and I just feel like I have a lot of free time right now and I want to pay off my, my, my master's degree. Um, I want to get ahead in terms of financially. I want to start real estate investing. Will you help me? Like, will you give me guidance? I said, of course I'll give you guidance. I talk to people about this all the time. Of course I will. I, I got her started flipping. I said, nice. here's what you're going to do. You're going to learn how to evaluate properties. Um, I'll give you a real simple calculator, but this is only like an 80, 20. This will kind of get you in the ballpark and you're going to have to dial in if you find something that looks good. And I want you to start making tons of offers. I want you to get on every wholesaler's list, including mine, but everybody else too. And here's how you find things on the MLS. Here's how you, here's how you get the ARV. Here's how you figure out renovations and I'll walk through and I'll do some renovation estimating with you, but you have to learn it. And I just threw her into it. And, you know, I've, I've coached people over the years. I've, I've dealt with thousands of real estate investors who will give you every excuse under the sun why it won't work. My daughter found three deals in the first month, three deals. I didn't make the offers. I, I, I counseled her on what I thought was a good deal, but I, I would do that for any number of people that I've met over the years. Wow. And, and she found three deals right away. So she started off flipping and I'll tell you why, listen, you, I was nodding and saying yes, but there's one, one caveat I want to make when it comes to f- wholesaling and flipping flippers need to raise money or borrow money or whatever, usually to buy ho- houses or properties, right? Unless you're independently wealthy, but they st- still, most people are buying houses using uh, some sort of institutional funding or private lending or something. Mm-hmm. So there's some risk there. You're, you're buying this property. It's tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars of, of investment, depending on where you live. But I, will, I, I had this debate with, with somebody in my family who said, yeah, house flippers take all the risk. You wholesalers have no risk. You know, where do you get off making all this money? And I, I said, listen, when I buy a house as a flipper, okay, let's just, I'll use Michigan numbers or I'll make them easy. I buy a house for $50,000 that's worth $120,000 after renovation. So I bought it for 50. Well, the, the day I buy it, it's probably worth 80 or 85, right? Because that's just how we buy. So the day I buy it, it's not, it's sort of protected by its own value and asset, right? Mm-hmm. As I put money into it, it's going from that 85, it's creeping up to the 120 value because I'm adding value by putting. So it, almost at no point is the money that's invested at real risk because the house could just be liquidated and you could recover the money because you're always owe less than what it's actually worth at the time, right? It's not that there's no risk. You can make mistake with numbers, but assuming your numbers are all correct, the risk is certainly minimized. Now, as a wholesaler, especially when you're scaled up, okay? So, at the beginning of last year, when I was having this conversation, uh, I was spending on on my marketing budget for wholesaling was in the $30,000 a month marketing spend, right? So, I I told him, I said, listen, I'm spending $30,000 a month. There's no asset that that's being put against. There's no mortgage in place. That money is in the ether. If no one calls me or I don't get any inquiries from that, that marketing that I'm doing, poof, it's gone. And believe me, I've had months where I did not make what I spent on marketing when I was ramping up or trying something different. So the risk that you take especially when you're scaled up, if you're doing a lot of marketing, and I know there's other ways to find deals. You don't have to spend a lot of money on marketing. But if you're doing that because you're building this machine that requires a lot of, a lot of opportunities, believe me, there's risk, right? So it depends. And if you're, if you're doing wholesaling and you're like one to two deals every three or four months and you're kind of just bumping around, you're finding them by accident and you're kind of networking, that's great. And it's, it is very risk-free because you're not spending money. But if you have a system where you have reliable, consistent deal flow coming in, it's probably because you're spending some money on 
pay-per-click, direct mail, uh, text blast, ringless voicemail, whatever your, your mode is, there's money going out that's at risk. There's no asset that is protecting that money. So yeah. that's my little rant on wholesaling being risk-free. No, I, I believe wholesalers, yeah, you're right. Wholesalers spend first, right? M money goes out long before deal flow. So if somebody who says hey, wholesalers don't have risk is either doesn't understand what risk is or just not paying attention. So exactly. how, so when you first flip that first or not flip, sorry, wholesale those first two houses, do I have it right? Was that 2016 or was that 18? I forget. No, it was earlier. That was probably, it was right at the end of my flipping, which was around 2014. Okay. So two, okay. So you ramp from being uh, kind of a single operator, I'm going to guess doing mm -hmm. those first two to now doing 30,000 a month in um, marketing expenses. How does someone get there? Cause I'm sure it's just not one step. I mean, how do you go from a solo operator to a big business like that over <laughs> four or five leaps? Uh, probably equal parts tactical knowledge that I got and, and, uh, and mindset. Mm -hmm. And I, I know that people, when you talk about real estate, everyone wants to know what tools are you using, what software you're using to analyze deals. Like what, do you, what does your postcard look like that you send out? Like all these tactical things. And those are important, believe me, but a hundred percent, every bit is important. Maybe even more important is getting my mind set for success. And, and that sounds mm. super soft and fluffy. And I get that. It's a little frustrating when you're like looking to something to hold on to and do right now. But the reality was for me to get from doing at the time, like when, before my, so my company hockey stick from a flipping standpoint, when I kind of, my wife and I sort of said, let's let me just do this on my own. Right. right. It's just because I was super, had a lot of risk tolerance and there was a hockey stick there. And then the next real hockey stick, like, like made the first one look like a speed bump was when I, I joined a mastermind and I surrounded myself with people and I was in my local market. The problem in your local market sometimes is you can be the big dog and sort of not be that big of a dog, but you're the biggest dog in your neighborhood. So you're the biggest dog, right? I sort of got a little comfortable for a while because I was, I was speaking at RIA's people were like coming to me for mentorship and all this. And it didn't necessarily go to my head, but I just, I couldn't see any farther than what I was doing because nobody was doing much more than I was doing or, or a lot of cases they were doing a lot less. And that's really, that's really harmful to someone who has the aspirations to grow. So once I joined this mastermind, all of a sudden I was surrounded by people who were a little bit behind where I was, right where I was, and some people that were way past me. And the people who were right where I was and way past me gave me vision beyond my limited vision in Southeast Michigan, my little local, you know, count couple of counties areas that I was dealing in. And I started seeing like, whoa, like I met a guy who was doing a hundred deals a year. I mean, to me, that was like off the charts. The biggest guy in my market before I got kind of like a little bit, a little bit more, a little bigger. He, he did 26 deals in a year and he was 100% the rock star of our, of our RIA, like beyond rock star. People couldn't even wow. conceive what he was doing. Right. And I met someone in this RIA who are in this, um, in this mastermind that was doing a hundred deals a year, like confirmed, like legit. And he wasn't working 80 hours a week. Like he, his, his wife's complaint was that she was bugging him too much because he was following her around the house bored. And I was like, <laughs> what are you talking about? Like, what are you doing? So I started talking to him and some other folks who were kind of well past where I was at and realized just my own head was in my way. Like my big mantra was I can't hire anybody in my business because I don't feel like I make enough. I'm not big enough to hire people, but you can't get big enough and make enough if you don't hire people. It's like this vicious circle. And I convinced myself, I just wasn't, I wasn't there yet. Right. But I was, I didn't know it. So once I started bringing people in strategically, not recklessly, but bringing people in, some of them were on uh, um, uh, like, uh, what do you call it? Like um, commission, like commission based, sure. um, incentive based kind of things. And, and really importantly too, when I was flipping as successful as I thought I was, every flip I did was like this new adventure. I was going to Home Depot. I was picking new tile. I was picking new flooring. Like <laughs> I was picking new backsplash and brand new like cabinets I had never used before. I'm looking, it's like, I, and then somebody was like, what do you, 
like an, everything you do, you need to systemize this. You need to come up with a process that you're repeating every single time so you're not reinventing the wheel every time. So when I started creating systems and processes, bringing people in, and by the way, when you bring people into your company, to me, the biggest things that you need to look for when you decide to bring someone in, what are you bad at? And where are the bottlenecks? And I was doing things that I was bad at and I was my own bottleneck. So when I brought people in to re and by the way, I said at the beginning of this, um, a beginning of this conversation that I, I'm not detail oriented. So I should not be handling the yeah. ma minutia of my company because it bogs everyone down. So when I brought someone in and downloaded some of that stuff to them, like the wheels started moving faster. Like everything was just like started humming along the pistons to use a or automotive reference. The pistons were firing. It was just, everything started working better. And the things that I didn't like when I hired someone, I didn't care how much of it I got. So in other words, answering the phones, I don't like answering the phones on that initial call from the sellers and doing that. I'm not a sales guy by nature. So I would dread the phone ringing, which is ridiculous, was how my business grew. I would, I would dread it. So when I hired someone to answer the phones, I stopped caring how much the phones rang. So I started putting more marketing, started putting more, myself out there to get more opportunities because I didn't care if the phone rang all day. In fact, that was good. But when I was answering it, I sort of hoped I didn't get to it in time and it would go to voicemail. And then when I called them, I like secretly would hope they wouldn't answer and I could leave a voicemail. Like, it's, it's crazy. You can't, you can't build a business that way. But I got out of my own way and realized what I was bad at, what I was holding everyone back on because I was doing it and started delegating that stuff. Wow. That is, that is so much fun. As we kind of wrap up this first episode, get, getting into the second one we'll, where we'll talk about the market today. Mike, what does your business look like today? Like what, how many employees, how many markets? Just paint us a vision of where you are today so it'll be a jumping off point for our second interview. Okay. It's funny. It's changed. My business has contracted in size, but the goal was to stay profitable. So I, I blew up to like a 13 person team at one mm. point about a year and a half ago. We were, we were overstaffed. We were, we were not very efficient and there were some things that, that we didn't do well. So we kind of contracted, we're down to five people now. Okay. Um, we're doing, we're not doing $30,000 in marketing anymore, but we're getting the same amount of deals, which is, you know, on, a, on an average one thing, coronavirus has a little bit slowed us down. There's no doubt about it. We've, we've hit a little bit of a slowdown. We're, we're changing our whole business. And we'll talk about that in the next one. Um, so we're anywhere between five and 12 deals in a month at this point. Uh, Pre-corona, we were in that eight to 12 range. So it's taken a little bit of a dip. Um, and we're doing 80% wholesaling, 20% flipping. We made a strategic decision to start flipping at the beginning of the year more when we thought we could monetize it a little better. And then coronavirus hit. Michigan was very, very severely um, uh, quarantined. So yeah. we're sort of at a standstill with some flips. Ironically, we start doing flips like right when we can't do the work anymore. But <laughs> anyways, we can talk about that. But that's where we are now. Mostly wholesaling kind of in that, you know, probably at six to eight range in terms of deal flow right now. And we're just figuring it out. We're changing our model a bit to try to move with the cheese. Yeah. And then uh, just to make sure we're still South Michigan. Still in South Michigan? I, yeah, I lost, I, I lost you there. Sorry, you froze. Um, yeah, I'm still in Southeast Michigan. Yes. All right. Very cool, Mike. Well, thank you very much. This has been great. I look forward to our second interview. Awesome.